studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Filmmaker Cameron Crowe is best known for such films as Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Say Anything, and his 1996 Oscar-nominated Jerry Maguire. But what many may not know is that he got his start as a rock reporter. At the age of only 15, he was on tour with such bands as Led Zeppelin, The Eagles, and The Allman Brothers, writing cover stories for Rolling Stone magazine. His new film, Almost Famous, chronicles those heady years, and here is a clip. You know, because once you go to L.A., you're going to have friends like crazy, but they're going to be fake friends. You know, they're going to try to corrupt you. You know, and you got an honest face, and they're going to tell you everything. But you cannot make friends with the rock stars. Okay, okay. If you're going to be a true journalist, you know, a rock journalist, at first you never get paid much. But you will get free records from the record company. Nothing about you that is controversial, man. God, it's gonna get ugly, man. They're gonna buy you drinks. You're gonna meet girls. They're gonna try to fly you places for free, offer you drugs, and I know it sounds great. But these people are not your friends. You know, these are people who want you to write sanctimonious stories about the genius of rock stars, and they will ruin rock and roll and strangle everything we love about it, right? And then right. it just becomes an industry of cool. I mean, I'm telling you, you're coming along at a very dangerous time for rock and roll. And that's why I think you should just turn around and go back, you know, and be a lawyer or something. I can tell from your face that you won't. I can give you 35 bucks. Give me a thousand words on Black Sabbath. An assignment? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pleased to welcome Cameron Crowe to this table for the very first time and to take note of a book that I much admire called Conversations with Wilder, um, in which he had a series of conversations with the great Billy Wilder, and it's in this book about directing and about Wilder's career. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, it's a great to have you here. Honor to be here. <laughs> Big fan. Uh, what's great about this movie is that it is something that has lived in your heart, a yeah. story you wanted to tell. Yeah. It was the one I always ran back to anytime I hit a roadblock on whatever I was working on. I want to write that movie about Lester Bangs. <laughs> and uh, one Lester day. Lester Bangs was a character played right there by. Yeah. Tom. The great Philip Seymour Hoffman. Right. He's such a wonderful actor, and he really caught the spirit of this uh, early mentor I had, uh, Lester Bangs, right. one of the original rock critics, who just saw the future coming. Just a wonderfully vivid character that uh, you can't make up a guy like that. And so the movie, hopefully, is populated with a lot of real-life uh, figures that I met back then. But the story, what was it you wanted to do? I mean, you kept coming back to this, yeah. which is to give us a sense of what it was like yeah. to be in the midst of rock and roll in the 70s. Mm -hmm. The early 70s, with a little bit of a hangover of the 60s and, uh, and no real definitive course for what was ahead. It was, there was a lot of passion and uh, music that was made from the heart personal music made I think for one person and hopefully many people would appreciate it but the audience seemed to be one soulful person and I wanted the movie to feel like that too for those who don't know tell me what this movie is about it's a you know it's about loving music it's about the way music makes you feel when you're alone in your car and you hear this great song and you look both ways and you turn it up and get lost in it <laughs> I just wanted to see if we can make a movie that made you feel that way and it's also about family, yeah. you know, the families of bands on the road, the families of the groupies, and uh, and just how they all crisscrossed at a at a very specific time. Having said that, I want you to elaborate more on that. But it's also what it is in terms of some linear way. It's the yeah. story of a young boy, yeah, uh, who in fact is based loosely on your life. Yes, who decides that he wants to write. Right. He meets the editor of Cream. Yeah. And, and who has a chance, because he disguises his voice and sounds more adult, yeah. to go out in the rock and roll world and write about a band. This is the story of his introduction to the world of rock and roll. Right. And deciding whether he's going to be a fan mm -hmm. or he's going to be a reporter. Yeah. And or all both. the characters he meets. Yeah. yeah. And it's my story. Uh, 
I, I kind of ran from the personal aspects of it for such a long time because I didn't want it to ever feel like the glory of me. Um, but I did want to tell the story of, you know, what it was like to be 15 and kind of joining the circus, running away from home and getting accepted by these bands who were my heroes. Why did they accept you? There was a generation of older rock writers just before me who kind of, they loved Bob Dylan, they loved Van Morrison, but these new hard rock bands, you know, who, who's going to go spend two weeks on the road with Deep Purple? Me. <laughs> and I never wanted to go home. And I had long hair would hang in my face, and I'd try and hide how old I really was, and inevitably somebody would just kind of say, how old are you? And I would, you know, maybe add a few years to my actual age, but, but basically I was the youngest, most passionate rock journalist they'd met. So they said, stick around with us. We'll show you what it's like. They adopted you almost. They made you a kind of... They did. And the movie, I wanted to have that feel too. I wanted the movie to kind of, you know, say, come over here, let me show you what this world was like. That was sort of the way we tried to do it. When you set out to make it, what did you think you had to accomplish? Mm. Uh, truth and uh, a, a real authenticity a sense of about scene. the details because so often the details seem wrong. And I kept so much of this stuff. I mean, we've lived with the boxes of my artifacts uh, from that time for years. And I've just start. it begins in the beginning of the movie. I start using all this stuff that I've kept forever, hotel keys and... Uh, now, somebody actually said, passes. make us look cool. Yeah. It was Glenn Fry from the Eagles. <laughs> Which and, figures, uh, it? <laughs> yeah, no, it was wonderful. He 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 was probably the coolest guy I'd met, yeah. and everybody was saying, "Hey, I'm this. Make sure you put in your story that I'm this and that." And Glenn just said, "Hey, hey. just make us look cool." <laughs> and that line was added as we were filming. I kind of uh, took Billy Crudup aside and said, "Put this in," because I remembered this moment. And Billy Crudup does it so beautifully in the movie. It was exactly how it happened to me, and I felt gently manipulated. But I wanted to be cool, and I wanted to make sure they looked cool. So it's all a glorious, uh, fuzzy line we were trying to walk. When you were creating the movie, yeah. uh, it is said that you direct in a fallen way. That every, it, there's a kind of impromptu quality about your directing. Yeah. Was it true here where you reach out and say, Billy, try this line? Mm -hmm. Is that the way it is? You've got music going over here mm -hmm. that you can later take away right. when you get into the editing room, take it off a track, Yeah. to create some other kind of mood for your actors. It, it's true. I found it a lot on Jerry Maguire. Tom, Tom Cruise is such a, um, a wonderful actor and just says, I want to please you, whatever you want. You're the director. I want to be your vision. And uh, so I yeah, started to feel... What a great thing for an actor to say to you. It's just empowering in every way. And, and I felt looser than ever as a director. And I began to tell more story, uh, more about the story as I went. And on this movie, I'd play songs while we were in the middle of a scene or shout lines out. And, uh, and hopefully, overall, I, I thought around the time of Jerry Maguire, I want to be an environmental director. I just want to quietly create a world where all these people feel they can do what they want and they are the characters they're playing. And when, when uh, extras or people on the street see a set of a movie I'm making, they always think the cinematographer is the director because he's the one going, put the camera over here! Yes. But the director really yeah. is sitting at a table and that's me. And I love that. I love that it just kind of happens. Nobody's got a bullhorn, you know? The story you tell, and in the end, someone said about it, he did it with mercy in mm. the end. He came down on the side of mercy. Mm. Uh, it is a loving look yes. at the world that you inhabited yeah. then. It's, it's loving, but the barbs are there. There's a, there's a sadness and uh, uh, sometimes anxiety. Sadness pain, about? Just beneath the surface, I think, of the movie. It's almost like a great pop song, uh, the kind of album that the Beach Boys would make with Pet Sounds, where you listen to it and it's God only knows. But you listen to the lyrics and you see there's a real ache there. And I, 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 that's what I wanted the movie to give you, uh, a love and compassion for the characters, but also you see they're making mistakes and they're trying to get on the right track. And they're full of yeah. all the same kinds of things everybody else is, ambition and ego and, and competition and yeah. turf and, and wanting to be. 
it's famous. it's it's the world that uh, Billy Wilder's best movies uh, traffic in. You know, the sweetness and the pain, the sweetness. Because the movie came after this. Yes. So how did this inform what you did in this movie? Well, actually, Almost Famous is sort of the movie that Billy Wilder never made. Yeah. He was a young journalist in Berlin at a wonderful, heady time. Never made his autobiographical movie. And I'm writing Almost Famous at night while I'm interviewing Wilder. So you can see me in the book saying, Billy, what about that autobiographical movie? Any <laughs> tips? <laughs> no, no tips. Who would want to see such a picture? And, and in fact, uh, I didn't uh, listen to Billy's feelings that uh, maybe a movie like that would be too personal. I sort of went headlong into it. And I'm so happy With no I did. fear that it would, might be too personal, with no fear that it would be a story that's not interesting to anyone but me and, and uh, all the people who lived the story. A lot of fear. <laughs> <laughs> but a you overcame it. Yeah, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, directing with a certain amount of raw emotionality made the movie more truthful because it wasn't glossy. It doesn't feel glossy to me. It doesn't feel glossy at all. Roll tape. Here's a scene in which you're being hired. Uh, the character is William, uh, is William, what's the last name of the guy? William? Miller. 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 Uh, roll tape. And this is when he's been hired by an editor at Rolling Stone magazine. Hello. William Miller. This is he. William, this is Ben Fong Torres. I'm the music editor at Rolling Stone magazine. We got a couple copies of your stories from the San Diego door. Is this the same William Miller? Yes, it is. Voice of God, howling dogs, the spirit of rock and roll. This is good, solid stuff, man. Well, thanks. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Listen, I think you should be writing for us. Any ideas? Uh, how about Stillwater? Stillwater? Hardworking band makes good? New album out there, third, starting to do something. Crazy. Let's do 3,000 words. We'll join the band on the road. We'll set up billing. Don't let the band pay for anything. We can only pay, let me see, 3,000 words. $700. All right, a grand. What's your background, William? Are you a journalism major? Yeah. What college? Honey, I need you to do that thing that fixes the garbage disposal. Well, I certainly know how my lady gets when you don't snap to it. Crazy. 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 Tell me about the young actor. Where'd you find him? Patrick Fugit. He's, uh, you know, he's just a fresh-faced, young fan slash actor from Utah. Yeah. He's a Salt real Lake thing. City guy. Yeah. yeah, it's a real thing. It's uh, sort of but a where miracle. Where did you find him? I mean, uh, some casting agent brought you and said, this is the guy Sent that a can tape play this in. part? They sent a tape in from Utah. It was one of hundreds. <laughs> and we lost it, actually, for a time. The casting director said, yeah, i got to show you this tape. This kid from Utah might be something. And then we couldn't find the tape. Yeah. And then it turned up in a, in a pile of tapes about to be destroyed. And we watched it and said, yeah, well, this could be the guy. What were you looking for? Uh... A fan. The, the movie is about fandom right. and the, the purity of, of loving a band or loving a piece of music so much that it hurts. And so often you see a glibness in actors that have experience at that age because they do commercials and things and they're professionally cute. And this guy was just wide open. He came to L.A. for the first time and he's standing in my office and I could see him just taking it all in. And I thought, that reminds me of me. <laughs> He's there great. Were, there was also, critics have noticed in writing about this, reviewers, mm -hmm. that he had a certain adult quality about him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a certain, yeah. while well, innocence, a certain fandom, mm -hmm. but also a certain maturity. Yeah. Well, as the thing he craves gets closer and closer, he gets more stoic and pretends to be older, like it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Women, music, rock star, the interview he wants, it starts to arrive and he's like, Hello. And uh, I just, you know, it, it, he feels like I'm spying on life when I watch his performance, which is all you can hope for. We're going to see now Kate Hudson. Great. Not your first choice. Sarah Pauly was your first choice. But the Penny Lane of Destiny. The Penny Lane Kate of Destiny. Hudson. <laughs> tell me the story. Well, tell me first who is Penny Lane and who is the character? Uh, Penny Lane is who a Who lives today. Yeah. But the main girl 
is uh, is a girl whose name was Penny Lane back then. Right. That was her uh, adopted um, her moniker was mm. Penny Lane, and she's a very pure soul. It still is. Never mm. sold her tales for money. Loves music more than anything else. She's the main girl that the character is based on. But there are a couple others. Right. Girls I would meet on every interview session with different band members, and they'd pretend to meet me for the first time. <laughs> Do you know uh, Laurie? Didn't I just see you with Led Zeppelin? Didn't I, I just like, see you with the yeah. Eagle? Didn't I'd I just like, see you oh, with... Oh, hi. And she'd say, nice to meet you. And I'd go, oh, hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> and I just liked that, that whole idea of the girl that dances from member to member, and then the kid who's really her age that never has a shot at her. Yeah. She wants this other guy. And she'll talk to you about the other guy, but you don't ever have a chance with her. Yeah. That was sort of the triangle that I saw a lot. And Penny Lane today mm -hmm. refuses to, almost no part of the publicity apparatus. She's, she's starting to talk to a few really? people, but she doesn't, uh, she doesn't trade in her experiences. There's no, not a tell-all bone in her body, which is wonderful. And looks back on this period of her life with what? You, she wrote me a letter, and she said, after she saw the movie, and this is one of the times that I sort of thought, whatever happens, I can walk away and feel great about this whole experience. She wrote me a letter and said, if I die tomorrow, uh, I know there's something out there that explains who I was. And uh, that's a great compliment. All right. Sarah Polly was going to play yeah. this part. Yeah. For whatever reason, left. Yeah. We, we had scheduling issues, and uh, it was basically our casting process on this movie got a lot of publicity. Everybody, I think, uh, goes to well-known actors at some point. They either do the movie or they don't. Right. Sarah is an incredible actress, dying to work with her, rising star for sure, passionate um, political person too. You know, we, we played around with the idea of doing it, and the publicity got out. But it's funny how the movie found itself Sometimes they say, you get the cast you deserve, and I, I would hear that and I would think, well, that's what they tell the person that doesn't get their first choice, but this is the cast. I get lost in the story every time I see the movie, and it's the first time I've made a movie that I can watch repeatedly, and part of it is because they all became their characters. Okay, their we'll talk more about casting in a moment. Kate Hudson is the one yeah. who plays this part. Yeah. She was on the set. She, Kate? Yeah. She was playing another part. Right. She was on the, she was there. Yeah. You knew her. Yeah. And after Sarah leaves, she was automatic? Oh, no. She, uh, it was dangerous because I wanted to give her a shot at the part, but I felt bad that if that didn't work out, now she goes back to the other part and feels disappointed. And, and I didn't want that. So it was a gamble. We tried her out in the part of Penny Lane. And I played this Joni Mitchell song, People's Parties. And I said, I want you to come into the room, and this is the song you hear in your head. And I want you to float around the room and make everybody feel at home and your own private soundtracks in your head. And so she did this to an empty room. And I'm videoing her. And I still have the tape. The tape is the birth of the character. Wow. And that's Kate. She lights up a room, even an empty room. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. Just you and a videotape. Yeah. And a camera. She's Goldie Hawn's daughter. Yeah. In Bill Hudson. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Roll tape. Take a look at this really remarkable performance by young Kate Hudson. Who are you with? Me? I'm with myself. No. Who are you with? What band? Oh, uh, I'm here to interview Black Sabbath. I'm a journalist. I'm not, not a, you know. You're not a what? You're not a what? Not a... groupie. Oh. Oh. Groupie? We are not groupies. This is Penny Lane, man. Show some respect. Groupies sleep with rock stars because they want to be near someone famous. We're here because of the music. We are Band-Aids. She used to run a school for Band-Aids. We don't have intercourse with these guys. We inspire the music. We're here because of the music. You know, she was the one who changed everything. She was the one who said, no more sex. No more exploiting our bodies and our hearts. Right, right. Just jobs, and that's it. <laughs> it's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. Penny. You can stab us! I think I saw 
Does anybody Casting continues. <laughs> the mother of William Miller is mm. played by Frances McDormand, who says, rock and roll is going to ruin you. He's going to steal my baby. Yeah. And don't do drugs mm -hmm. on the phone all the time. Um, my mom first, is still saying that to me. <laughs> She's going to oh, wonder how much if, of your mother's in the film. She's going to wonder if there's coffee here. And she's gonna <laughs> or say, is this straight? Cameron, you're on Charlie Rose. You're drinking coffee. Don't you know coffee is a drug? <laughs> like, Mom, it's really water. So all, all of this obsession mm -hmm. and paranoia that Frances McDormand, William's mother, had comes mm -hmm. straight from your mother. Character is... Yeah. Straight from my mom and straight from love. It mm -hmm. comes from love and it comes from the, the obsessive need to teach that my mom still has. It all is about knowledge. She would bring Dick Gregory to her college classroom, yet she would hate the idea of rock music because she said, rock is false advertising. It pretends to be one thing, but it's really selling you sex and drugs. Let's be honest here. Look at this Janis Joplin album. This is sex and drugs. You go, well, it's poetry too. Yeah, poetry third. That's my mom. Played by Frances McDormand. Yes beautifully I'm thrilled that we got her and I get movie. some credit some you do tiny little bit because yes. you saw her on the set here yes with Billy Crudup yeah they they were doing their play of Oedipus and you had a pretty rare interview with Francis and Billy Together. both both here and uh, I watched that show and I, I loved them together and I loved Francis's just offhanded natural way that she just dealt with Billy, dealt with the situation. I knew she didn't do many interviews. She looked on your show the way she looks in the movie, yeah. same hairstyle. I, I looked at that and I thought, you know what? I'd be proud to make the movie where that is Elaine Miller. And, uh, and she, she took a shot at it. Going in now, I mean, you've worked with Tom Cruise. It doesn't yeah. get any higher than that in terms <laughs> of casting, right? I mean, you know that if you need help, there's the guy mm. and be on your story that can help you. Yeah. It is said that you thought about Meryl Streep. Thought about it. She yeah. was unavailable. Yeah. It is said that you, <laughs> for the part of Russell, mm -hmm. guitarist, that you thought about Brad Pitt. Mm. And that even had gone further than thinking about it. Yeah. I even thought about David Bowie playing the road manager, but <laughs> Noah Taylor worked out better. But some of these had gone further than yes. others. True. Sarah Pauly and Brad Pitt. Yeah, and it's just a different version of the movie. I think the, the version where Brad Pitt plays the guitarist is more of a comedy. You have a band that is just so seriously <laughs> trying to hang on to the coattails of the guy who's yeah. just a bit more charismatic than them. Yeah. And that's a different movie. It's a little less of a documentary feel. And, uh, and it's very funny. You know, Brad is a brilliant comedian. And I think people are just now starting to realize that. He's making a movie now called The Mexican that I think is, he's going to explode in that comic sense. Who's he making this with? Uh, I think it's with DreamWorks. But he plays a very funny character, and I love his sense of humor. However, it would have thrown the movie off balance, and I think Brad knew it, and I knew it too. I'd love to work with him. But to think of this movie without Billy Crudup is criminal, because Billy brought an authenticity that the whole movie needed and I just the, the reasons for making the movie were about authenticity oh, but tell me more what he brought Billy yeah oh it's j it's a it's such a subtle thing the one thing I'm very proud of is uh, there are little touches in the movie clues everywhere really also in the performances things you can pick up on repeated viewings Billy uh, there's such subtlety in what he does. There's a scene where he, the scene we were talking about where he says, just make us look cool to the young journalist. Yeah. The manipulation that Billy Crudup performs on this kid trying to get him to write a good article on his band, it's a roller coaster ride, and Billy makes it look so easy. It's not a parody. 
it's not like any rock musician you've really ever seen. It's a very truthful thing. And I watch it and I think, man, I was that guy. I was that guy looking in the face of the charismatic guitarist, wondering, is he my friend? Is he working me? Mm. And in Billy your case, who was a charismatic guitarist? Well, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. Right. Uh, I chased him for weeks trying to get him to do the cover story for <laughs> Rolling Stone. This is a lot about the, the story of the movie is that. But at the end of the three weeks, he finally said yes, but... Yeah, my eyes were bloodshot. I just had, I, I could barely stand up straight. And he said, "Yes, I'll talk to you." Yes. I'm like, what do you love about music? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> All right, roll tape. This is Billy Crudup playing Russell, in which he tells uh, William that he only wants to be around real people with real feelings. Oh, here great. it is. From here on out, I'm only interested in what is real. Real people, real feelings. That's it. That's all I'm interested in. From here on out. You're real. Thanks. You know, you know all about us, and I don't know about you. Tell me, what's your family like? My dad died of a heart attack. And my sister believes that my mom is so intense that she had to escape our family. And they can't seem to find a way to get through it. I mean, they don't even speak to each other anymore. Plus, she gave me all her albums, and now she's a stewardess. <laughs> it's good to talk about. Really good. But here I am, telling secrets to the one guy you're not supposed to tell your secrets to. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh! You're Russell from Stillwater. <laughs> well, yeah, on my better days, I'm Russell from Stillwater. Hey, you want to go to a party with me at my friend Aaron's house? I, mean, I know you're a big rock star and all, but do you want to hang with some good people looking to have a good time? We're just real Topeka people, man. Yeah, this is great, isn't it? <laughs> now, the fact is, probably, and you've said this a couple of times here, because you didn't have a Brad Pitt. Mm hmm you know, and not, uh, it means that you get more into the movie, mm -hmm. right? And you can Even be a, though you're a guy who's used Tom Cruise and you're going to use him again. Mm -hmm. This story was better off feeling like you can discover it. You can discover and meet people for the first time. And that's one thing you can't really do. I guess you can with big stars. But it's easier if you get to discover the movie and these actors almost like you discover a piece of music. Mm -hmm. Back in about 92, yeah. you, you went back sort of and decided you were going to sort of what do what? Figure out what people were doing? Figure out how it is you wanted to direct? Was in 92? Some, yeah. Yeah, we'd, we had done a, a movie called Singles, which was you weren't thrilled a labor of love for me, yet it didn't hold together the way I wanted it to. And then I saw Pulp Fiction, yeah. and I said, damn. <laughs> now that's how you tell a story with chapters, and really, you, keep, you make it cohesive. And for some reason, I got into structure, and studying some of the great structured screenplays. And that road takes you right to Billy Wilder. And more than ever, I studied the great screenplay writing of Billy Wilder and IAL Diamond. And just just steeped myself in what they did. The one thing that I could never find is an interview, an extended interview with Wilder himself. And later I would pick up that thread and, and, and get a chance to do this book with him, which is probably the greatest gift of Jerry Maguire, that, that Billy saw that movie, and we had tried to get him to act in it, but he, he saw the movie and said, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you. Come and talk to me for your column. I had no column, but I started talking to him. The, the, uh, the wonderful thing, though, is it's better than any film school studying Wilder's work and Why? some of the Why? other directors, too. Because Billy gives you, he gives you the sweet and the sour. He gives you, as he says, a lack of bad sentimentality. Mm -hmm. And it makes his stuff timeless. Characters behave in a real way. They're, they're nasty to each other. They're romantic with each other. Basically, they're like people are in life with each other. And yet, the story is always told. And I just, I wanted to be a part of that tradition. He's seen the film? Yes. And he said what? Wonderful picture, terrific picture. 
which was the payoff to a very excruciating two hours, Charlie. <laughs> Did he also say, excruciating, and sit there with him and watch him? Yeah. In the room, you were in the screen room with him, or did you let him watch it alone, or what? No, I was in the screening room with him, and uh, he had asked to see it on a big screen. Yeah. And uh, I, I sat there, knowing that at any given time, it might not be his cup of tea, he's not the biggest rock fan. He and his amazing wife, Audrey, showed up, and they watched the movie, and I watched them watching the movie quite a bit <laughs> of the time. And... And I took the ride of just watching them. How are we doing? And I turned the volume down sometimes when uh, the Black Sabbath songs came right. on too loud. <laughs> it's too loud! <laughs> but, but uh, and you know, I got to tell you, the, the greatest moment for me was there's a moment in the movie when Kate Hudson finds out um, she's been dealt with rather poorly by the man she loves. And she has a line, uh, the, the payoff of which is, what kind of beer? To me, that always felt like a little mini tribute to Billy. Yeah. So whatever his reaction to the movie, I wanted to watch his face watching that line, and, and I did, and he laughed. He laughed heartily, which is, he's a tough <laughs> laugh. Yeah. Be grateful when Billy Wilder <laughs>, laughs. Um, and I felt, you know, wow, that's what it's all about. Two other people, Tarantino, Quentin. Yeah. You, you got something from... Pulp Fiction mm -hmm. about sort of chaos having maintaining a storyline or something holding together. Well said, chaos, a structured chaos uh, that keeps you hanging yeah. and gives you that buzz. There's a buzz that Quentin stuff gives you. It's the buzz of good filmmaking, and some of that comes from craft. And I wanted to learn craft heading into Jerry Maguire and this movie. And what has James L. Brooks given you? He, he, James Brooks is a character genius, like Billy, I think. He celebrates... He understands character. He understands from character. From all the things that he's directed. And, and here's the holy grail for right. me. You tell a story where by the middle of the movie, you know these characters so well that they can twitch, and you go, ah, I know what that character's <laughs> thinking. I am that character. And Jim crafts those moments so beautifully, and so does Wilder. And Wilder has a phrase for it. He says, you sugarcoat that pill so that they swallow it and they know the story before they even know they're being told a story. And before they know it, there's a delight in every little thing the character does. And that, those, are, those are the two guys to study. What's the line between this movie and your life, where mm -hmm. you have, in a sense, told your story, and you becoming a filmmaker? I mean, mm -hmm. did you know early on, after writing for Rolling Stone, that really what I want to do is write? And what I want to do is then write screenplays. And if you write screenplays, you want to direct movies. I mean, give me a sense of this evolution that you went through. My, my dream was to write for Rolling Stone. Yeah. Then it was, maybe you get a story on the cover. Yeah. Then, if you really get lucky, they'll put your name on the cover. Yeah. When I was 18, that happened. And I remember thinking, where does it go from here? Okay, more stories on the cover. So I did rock writing for a number of years. And it led to a book, Fast Times at Ridgemont right. High, which led to, even Pretty though cool. I loved movies, I never thought I would get into the making of movies. But they offered me a chance to adapt the book, and I did. And that led me to, to this, directing my own stuff. And Brooks was sort of, was a producer for McGuire. He was. And he was also the producer of the first movie that I directed, Say Anything. And uh, liked my journalism. He, he's a, as you know, I think, I think you, yeah, been on you know Jim, and he is a great student of journalism as well as right, film. Right. Made broadcast news. Yeah, he made broadcast news, and he knew, he knew that I had an eye for detail, and he said, okay, let's, let's, let's see what we can grow in the garden here. <laughs> and he fed me movies to watch and things like that, and, and we tried to get people to direct my screenplay of Say Anything. At one point he said, if one more person turns you down, you should put yourself on the list and think about it. And I did, and I directed the movie. Right. Take a look at this. This is Fast Times at Ridgemont High, seen between Sean Penn and Ray Walston. Here it is. Outright. Think about it. Cuba owned by a disorganized parliament over 4,000 miles away. Cubans were in a constant... Cubans were in a constant state of revolt. In 1904, 
The United States decided to throw a little weight around and, uh... Who is it? Mr. Pizza Guy. Again? Mr. Pizza Guy, sir. <laughs> Pour the double cheese and sausage. Right here, dude. Here, you go, dude. Am I hallucinating here? Just what in the hell do you think you're doing? Learning about Cuba, having some food. Mr. Spicoli, you're on dangerous ground here. You're causing a major disturbance on my time. You know, I've been thinking about this, Mr. Han. If I'm here and you're here, doesn't that make it our time? <laughs> Certainly there's nothing wrong with a little feast on our time. You're absolutely right, Mr. Spicoli. It is our time. Yours, mine, and everyone else's in this room. But it is my class. Hamilton, Brandt, Cornfeld, up front. Mr. Spicoli has been kind enough to bring us a snack. And be my guest. Help yourselves. Get a good one. What's the hardest thing about a transition from screenwriter writer to director? I think lear learning to let the camera help you tell your story being visual and not being so strict with your own screenplay that you can't get free with the visual part of it. It's a long road. Yeah. How about working <laughs> with actors? Boy, I, I used to be so nervous working with actors. Now I crave it. I crave it because they're your partners. And if you create the right environment, boy, they will sail. They'll take your stuff and take it to a place you never imagined. Like Frances McDormand in this movie couldn't have ever imagined she would give she so much. She took the much. character beyond where you ever imagined. Beyond. My, my mother was on the set frightening <laughs> me and she, uh, she actually talked to Francis and, and said, please don't play me shrill. And Francis said, Alice, it won't be you and it won't be me. It's going to be someone else. And it is. Someone else. Isn't that great? I and mean, is your mother happy? She's very happy. She says, I, don't, I never went around barefoot in the house. <laughs> okay. Point well taken, Mom. Uh, your dad. Yeah. Not in the film. Not in the film. And sadly, uh, not with us. He, he died right after Say Anything came out. So he, he saw me become a director, and he was very proud of that. And uh, I, I'm, I will be forever grateful that he saw me make that transition. There is an ache that still exists in my family. Uh, we missed my dad a lot. And I wanted the movie to have that ache in it. That empty chair is still at the table in Almost Famous. And if you look, it's there in every scene in the home. The movie, in a lot of ways, is about that empty chair. Mm -hmm. And I had shots of the empty chair, which was really about, you know, that was hitting it over the head. And I took him out. Uh, but so it's sort of a panning around and you see an empty yeah, chair kind see of thing. Yeah, and the camera would You're go back pointing around. Pointing it out too heavy. Too heavy. I, in fact, I shot the empty chair so much, we were watching it in dailies and people were saying, got the point, Cameron. <laughs> no, I see the chair's empty. <laughs> Your dad's not really. there, we know. We got it. <laughs> and, but it's there. It's there if you, if you want to look for it. Yeah. And, and the dad is a part of the story. And it comes in early when Francis says uh, we have to be both his mother and his father to the sister. Are you a student of film? Yes. In the way that Quentin is and other people like that? Yeah. Because it is said that you, Francois Truffaut mm -hmm. influenced this film. He did. He made that wonderful series of movies that began with 400 Blows and he had his guy uh, Jean-Pierre Liod who, who looked just like him. <laughs> And they grew up together. It's just a beautiful thing. And my dream was that Patrick Fugit could be that for me. I was looking at him yesterday. He's, he's grown about this much. His voice is much deeper now. <laughs> he doesn't have to pretend his voice is deeper. And I was like, damn, we're getting ready for the next phase here. Love and marriage. You and me, we've got to yeah. do this again. And did other screen characters and actresses influence Penny? Like yes. Audrey Hepburn? Like 
Shirley yeah. MacLaine like? Yeah, my my uh, my friends tell me I keep writing Shirley MacLaine, <laughs> and it's true. What is it about? I'm Shirley proud MacLaine? of that. But, but what is it about Shirley MacLaine that you keep bringing back? <laughs> uh, <laughs> is this, is this Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell has an incredible line in one of her songs. She says, uh, "Laughing and crying, you know it's the same release." That's Shirley MacLaine to me, and that's Kate Hudson, and that's Penny Lane. Yeah. It's you leave the camera on long enough, she may laugh, she may cry, she'll probably do both. Yeah. And I love those characters. There's just so much going on. Yeah, Penny. I mean, Kate Hudson says Penny Lane. The character she plays is at the core sad. Yeah, I agree. But I don't understand why she's sad. Is she sad because this is a world that she's just skittering through? Or what? She knows... She knows her role is on the periphery? What? She, when the movie begins, she's retiring. Yeah. I love the idea of a 17-year-old, 16-year-old <laughs> yeah, character. Sick. I'm saying, I'm retired. <laughs> I'm, I'm retired, don't get used to me, I'm gone. Yes. I think she realizes she's not a musician. Music is changing. Mm. And uh, what's, what's here for me? Maybe I've got to take care of myself and take the music with me rather than me always going to the music. And that's why she takes her voyage at the end. And that's why the one scene, the one thing I would change about this movie is the scene when she dances in the trash left from a concert in an empty arena you know that one scene i could i could watch it for an hour and a half i would love to make it longer i just and you should have left it out well i i i let it it goes for about 10 seconds or so but i i watch the movie and i just think no, oh, I could have gone for at least. No, another so what's your point? You should have minutes. left it out, or you should have left it in longer. Longer, oh, longer, I see. longer. I see. And uh, and it's the one thing I would change to make that longer because that. That's the only thing. That's the core of Penny Lane. You know, she's gonna she's gonna celebrate what was just there, and it may never come back again. But she's gonna honor the music uh, in the last waning moments before she's out of there. Yeah. Is it? Is it Led Zeppelin, the Eagles, who? Who is it, what period of rock and roll was purest for you, was the mm. most penetrating, the most satisfying? Mm. Is it the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s? It's, this movie celebrates the early 70s, which right. is an amazing time. It's the beginning of Led Zeppelin, right. it's Joni Mitchell, it's, um, you know, so many of the bands that are now called classic rock. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who else was there. Uh, I loved Deep Purple. I yeah. love Jethro Tull. I yeah. think you know these these yeah. these groups that are sort of spinal tapized at this point. They had a lot of the movie that satirized rock. Right. Right. Yeah, um, but rock gets passionate and important every couple of years. In '92, we had Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and that was just a year after everybody was saying rock was dead. They said rock was dead then. They say rock is dead now. I'm dying to see what song's being written in a garage right now that's going to bring it all ragingly back. And are you convinced there is? Oh, definitely. Definitely. As long as there's somebody... A song or a performer? Both. Generally, it's going to be a song, I think. And the song creates the performer. But as long as there's a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old alone in a room <laughs> dying to get out, there's an anthem that will arrive. Because every generation or every... has to have... Yeah. Who is it for you? I um, mean, what song has spoken to you more than any other song in rock history? You know, it changes. The song I love the most now is is in this movie twice, and it's called Feel Flows. It's yeah. by the Beach Boys, and it just puts you in a frame of mind. The lyrics are almost nonsense, but it's a profound nonsense, yeah. which is what Lester Bangs always said the greatest rock was. Profound nonsense. Profound nonsense. <laughs> Righteously dumb. <laughs> Celebrate it. Wave the flag for it. Lester's, is, I'm, I don't want to go away. I'm, I'm a little scared to say this, but Lester is now deceased? Yes. How long has he been gone? Uh, he died in 82. Oh, so it's been a while. Yeah. But he saw it all coming. He never, he never saw MTV, never lived to know Madonna, anything that was coming, yet he knew it was coming. And he died prematurely. There's a, a great book on his life called Let It Blurt, yeah. written by Jim DeRogatis, that's worth checking out just if you want to learn more about him. 
that he was uh, quite a quite a passionate voice. The title almost famous. Was that yeah. always going to be the title? No, I wanted it to be <laughs> untitled, Charlie. I thought it would. I thought this could be the movie. Let's go see the movie with no title. Didn't quite work out. No, that what way. was the alternative? Was it anything? Um, no, it was always untitled for me. But eventually, <laughs> meaning you were eventually going to choose a title. No, I thought Misha we should call it untitled, like the fourth Led Zeppelin album with no title. <laughs> These were the crazy thoughts spinning around. <laughs> and, and who came up with Almost Famous? You? I had Almost Famous on an early script because it's the name of the tour that the band yeah. goes on. Um, and a friend of mine said, "Why don't you call it Almost Famous?" Yeah. And I thought, well, if that's too much about celebrity, I would be worried. But eventually I came to realize that that helped say that the movie's also about those people standing on the side of the stage that aren't the star. Like, who are those people that are up there? They're almost, They're famous. almost famous. And the movie does tell the story of star yeah. and the almost famous. And from the rock and roll world, who's in this? Um, Peter Frampton makes yeah. a cameo. But do you, he also gets a credit at the end. Yeah, he wrote a couple songs. Yeah. He was the technical advisor. Oh, that's he what I he saw changed uh, Billy Crudup's guitar strings. <laughs> we watched Billy learn how to play guitar like proud Frampton parents. Chose him? I mean, taught him? Yes. Taught him, showed him how to stand. We both, uh, we both really worked with him. Yeah. Make love to the guitar, Billy. Yes, make love to the guitar. You know, and we we would by the end of our rehearsals, I would stand with Peter and we'd watch and we'd we'd have a tear in our eye. Yeah. He's quite a guy. Isn't he? <laughs> and my wife Nancy Wilson wrote the songs uh, yeah. from heart. She wrote the songs with with me for yeah. Stillwater. Um, Who I met before you came in here. Yeah, she's she's here with us. So we we had some some patron patron saints with us on this from the era. Nothing else you would do differently other than extend the dance sequence. Yeah, that's my folly. You know, I love that sequence. But this is this, this is, is close to what I wanted to do. do. Yeah. yeah, and if it's if it plays embarrassingly personal, that's good for me because the music I always loved was that way. And the next movie will certainly be much different. It's, it's is it a Tom Cruise sort of spy thriller or something like that? No, it's. It's a uh, it's a love story set in New York, contemporary right now with uh, Penelope Cruz and Tom Cruise, and hopefully Cameron Diaz. Yeah. Strange lineup. But it's just a love story. Cruz, Cruz, Cameron, Cameron. <laughs> it's already getting complex, but it's uh, it's a love story. Yeah. You and Cruz have a chemistry. I think so. He he said uh, at one point. Let's continue our collaborations. You know, I'd like to be the guy who uh, you work with repeatedly through the years, and that would be a great gift because I think he can do anything. He can. Yeah. And a huge potential. Huge potential. Just getting started. Really? Oh yeah. I've been working with him again on the new movie, and uh, I just. You know, I loved what he did in Magnolia. What's anyone call? I mean, what's it called? Vanilla. Vanilla Sky. Vanilla Sky. Right. And just from working on him and uh, working with him on this movie, I think he's beyond what he did in Jerry Maguire and Magnolia. He's just uh, he's out there pushing the envelope. He's, that's what I admire about him. He's out there pushing the envelope oh, yeah. more than you know. I mean, he really is there. There's certain people who I mean, take Billy Crudup's career. Yeah. I mean, everybody thinks this will just launch him into something and, nice. and a huge talent. He's on the cover of Esquire magazine. Uh, but Tom Cruise, he's, he's always pushed and he's doing something yeah. interesting. I mean, he went over there and spent several years yeah. to make the movie with Kubrick. Eyes Wide Shut with yeah. Stanley Kubrick, sure. which was tr tough for him, I know. Yeah. Because he gave up other things to stay there and hang in there. Yeah. But he was pushing the envelope. And still is. He, I don't think there's anything he can't play or wouldn't want to play. He always used to say this thing when we were making Jerry Maguire. I would say, you got one more in you? He'd say, I got a hundred more in me. Yeah. And we'd, uh, we'd do many versions of the scenes and just see what we could do. Oh, so you would shoot a lot of scene, a lot of takes in order to just experiment and play with so you can go yeah. back to the editing room? And we'd, get, we'd get something that we loved and then, then we'd say, okay, let's see if we can top it now. Uh, it's just a great. It, it's a wonderful time. You know, yeah, is an actress that has the same kind of relationship to you? An actress? Yeah. Kate, I think I got to a place yeah. with Kate Hudson on this where she we had our shorthand 
and I would say, I'm thinking, mm, and she'd say, mm, yeah, and she'd she go do it. She was very young, and she... Yeah. She said an interesting thing the other night. I said, how are you so confident in this movie? You're the most confident, relative, unknown actor yeah. that I've worked with. And she said, well, the camera has always in some way been focused on my family because of yeah. who my mother is. So I forget the camera. I forget the camera's there. And that is how she accomplishes the very difficult task that a film actor has of forgetting that there's a huge glowing machine right in your face a lot of the time. She forgets it's there. Totally yeah, the, confident. The interesting thing about her, and you think about her, you know, she was essentially raised by, I guess, by her father Bill Hudson, but also by uh, Goldie and, and Kurt, Kurt Russell. Yeah. And Kurt Russell together. She made a decision early on that she wanted to be an actress. Mm. You know, like 11 or 12 years old. Yeah. yeah. How about you in terms of what you want to do? And in terms of, I mean, if, if he knows no limitations, for example, you mm -hmm. said about Tom Cruise, what about you? I mean, do you, would you do something, what would be a huge challenge for you now that you've done this, now that this is getting fabulous reviews, and so, you know, you, you're out now telling your story, but what is it that would, where do you want this to go? Uh, yeah, I want to keep learning. I just want to keep getting better. Uh, and and if you've spent time around Billy Wilder, you know that you can <laughs> get a long way to go. Before, <laughs> and there's still a long way to go, exactly. And just stay curious, stay interested, and stay stay down in the foxhole. Right. S s stay anonymous enough so that you can always study what life is. Because uh, once you stand up and say, hey, hey, it's me, check me out, you lose a lot creatively, I think. Mm -hmm. You lose the ability to tell real stories about real people. Mm -hmm. So I always want to be able to sit in Denny's and overhear dialogue yeah. and right. try and make movies. But you'll continue to write. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Charlie. Congratulations. Wonderful. Thank you. Cameron Crowe, the film, the book is Conversations with Wilder. The film is we have been talking about. Almost Famous opens in New York and Los Angeles Friday, September 15th. It goes nationwide on September 29th. Thank you for joining us for the hour. See you next time. Thank you, my friend. Wow. Oh, enjoy it. <laughs>